Welcome back to the broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys so much for sticking with us through that three-minute break. I'm so excited right now. I can't even contain myself, ladies and gentlemen. We've got an amazing guest here lined up. For those of you guys who don't know, Mr. Gerald Salente, he founded the Trends Research Institute back in 1980. He's also the author of a couple of national bestsellers. One was Trends 2000. The other one is Trend Tracking, far better than the megatrends. Uh, and he's also the publisher of the internationally distributed quarterly trends journal, which I cannot recommend highly enough. Prior to founding the Institute, Salente was a government affairs specialist and an executive assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. He earned an honorary doctorate degree in law from the National University of Health Sciences and a master in public administration from the West University of uh, Virginia there. Also, for more than three decades, Gerald Salente has built his reputation as a fearless teller of the truth, an accurate forecaster, and an an analysis whose uh, expertise crosses many arenas from economics to politics, from health to science, and more. And most important, Gerald Salente is a pure political atheist. He is unencumbered by political dogma, rigid ideology, or conventional wisdom. His motto is one that I can absolutely agree with. Think for yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, He observes and analyzes the current events from future, and he forms future trends, seeing them for what they are, not as what he would like them to be. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome the one and only Gerald Salente to the program. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us on Red Pill Reports today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Oh, man, I got to tell you, as a side note, I'm an absolute huge fan, and uh, I'm absolutely looking forward to picking your brain a little bit today. And I know you only have a short amount of time, and I just did want to thank you again for taking some time out of your schedule. I guess right now, since you are kind of the guru of trends forecasting, uh, in terms of geopolitics and economics, we should probably look at the largest geopolitical and economic ball of wax that's on the horizon right now. All eyes to me are on Greece. What in the world is going to happen in Greece, in your opinion, sir? Well, you know, Greece is a big one, but it's not the biggest in the sense that it has economic implications, but they're really, it, it, it's the canary in the mine shaft, so to speak. Mm-hmm. We don't get the news here in the states of what's going on in the, with the discontents among people in their countries that have been robbed of their money under the name of austerity measures mm-hmm. and given to banks and, and, and the big investors who made bad bets. That's all it was. Ireland, uh, Portugal, Spain, one after another. Uh, they, they were forced to, to bail out people who made bad bets. And, of course, they always blame well, you know, it's these social programs. These workers are getting too much, <laughs> so, they, so we're going to cut back on their wages, and we're going to uh, we're going to cut back on their pensions and benefits, and their disability and uh, and their retirement benefits till after they die. Then they could start getting their benefits. So, what's going on in Greece? There'll probably be some kind of an agreement, uh, but to, it, the bigger story is that it's showing the weakness of the Eurozone and the Euro itself. When people go back, if they knew the story of what happened and why so many people really went on to the game of the the Euro, it was because, you know, Europe was wracked by war between the First World War and the Second World War, and they were sold the bill of goods that by having a united currency, you wouldn't have wars. And that's why so many people went with it. And I, and I know I was there, I spent, you know, time, I had a lot of friends there, and I knew the, I knew the culture of what was going on. And really all it was is a takeover. It's the multinationals grabbing their, their, uh, their action a lot easier by dealing with one currency and one set of rules so they could do a lot more grand manipulations at a much easier level. So Greece is probably, they're gonna make, they'll cut a deal. I, I I really don't think it. You know, I can be wrong, of course. You know, I don't know. I don't have the inside knowledge. But from what I'm reading and what I'm looking at, I believe they'll cut some kind of a deal, um, and uh, they'll make it work. The Shariza party isn't as radical as they're presenting it to be. Okay. Because if it was, he would be saying that we want to jump out of the euro. We the euro is a disaster for us. And we don't want any part of it. And by the way, that deal was manipulated through the Goldman Sachs gang. And the guy that was the head of the European division at that time that pushed it through, his name is Mario Draghi. 
I mean, that's when, when they brought Greece in. Greece wasn't qualified economically to go into the Eurozone, so they cooked the books. Oh, okay. And the guy that did the book cook, book cooking, his name is Mario Draghi, and of course he's the president now of the European Central Bank. Mm -hmm. So Europe, Greece, everyone knew that Greece was not qualified to go in. So they lied their way into the going into uh, becoming a member of the euro currency. So that to me, if Shiriza was really true to their word. They would drop out and say, listen, we're just not paying you. And that's the end of the game, man. You know, we're defaulting on the payment. We can't pay it back. We're going back to our own currency. Mm -hmm. See you later. And actually, now they're also pushing for um, war reparations I that Germany that. owes mm -hmm. them. And uh, also that they were forced to give Germany a loan during World War II. So, uh, and they want their money back. So we'll see where it goes, but... To me, the big ones, of course, are also Ukraine yes. and the United States uh, move into it. And again, the, the news is being totally skewed to make it seem like Russia was behind this whole thing, when in fact, anybody that wants to take the time to do the research, besides reading our Trends Journal, which we have it all documented, all they have to do is go on YouTube and listen to Victoria Newland, our Assistant <laughs> Secretary of State, right. whose husband is Robert Kagan, who's the prime slime of that neocon movement. And uh, at and there she is on the tele on the picked up her, her phone call with the, uh, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, uh, our ambassador to to, the, uh, to Ukraine, and talk, talking about the overthrow of the Yanukovych government and how they're going to put, quote, Yats in there. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, there's her at the uh, National Press Club in December 2013, flanked by two signs, one Chevron, one Exxon. <laughs> right. That had to be a say, coincidence, right, though? Yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 of course, and, and telling, the, telling actually the arrogance that Ukrainians are Europeans, and that's their future. Right. That's news to a lot of the Russian Europeans, and that I think the place borders Russia, if I'm not mistaken. I've read, know? I saw that in a pamphlet once, I think. Yeah. He did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and of course, the other the issue, uh, that doesn't make the news is that Joseph Biden's son, ah, oh, Hunter, yes. I love Coke Biden, is, um, the, uh, on the board of directors of Burisma Energy, the largest energy company in Ukraine, as well as Devon Archer, who's the business partner of um, uh, John Kerry, Secretary of State Kerry's stepson, Christopher Hines, of the 57 variety kind. He's also on the board of directors of Burisma Energy. So the people don't know what's going on, and they're buying the propaganda. Mm -hmm. And the propaganda is really building up. We're now bombing Syria. Uh, remember Obama said... Yeah, we're not going back into Iraq. We're just going there to save them Yazidis on the mountain. Right. And everybody knows what a Yazidi is. You got them living all over the neighborhood, you know. Yeah. And people bought it. And of course, they didn't, they didn't put troops back. They put advisors. That's right. Well-armed advisors. <laughs> Well-armed advisors. And I'm a guy that's old enough. I was draft bait during the Vietnam War. And that's what they called them back then. Right. Advisors. And I have to tell you, this sickness, this, this, it's a mental disease as I've been thinking about it. This penchant for war. It never stops. Mm -mm. Like what happened, we did a piece with this Brian Williams and, and how he's, um, been prosecuted by fellow prostitutes. And, and, you know, here this guy's playing G.I. Joe. And makes up this story about war and it's always glorifying the guys that saved them and, you know, this whiter than white golly gee whiz guy, right. you could trust me. And, and all they're doing is selling war. And we pointed out in detail how a book came out in 2008 by Scott McClellan, who was the former press secretary under George Bush. The name of the book is What Happened, and how he goes in detail how they pressure the media to buy the lies, and how the media bought them and sold them. And and it's quotes from Brian Williams, Katie Couric, Janice uh, uh, Yellen, or Jessica Yellen, 
uh, Charlie Gibson, one after another, saying that they were pressured by the White House and their uh, and their corporate bosses. Yeah, well, it's not surprising, really. I mean, fundamentally, but it's there. Mm-hmm. It's there, and no one wants to admit to it. I find it interesting that uh, that Williams has taken so much heat over lying about Iraq, while at the same time. Nobody's looking at Bush or Cheney or Rumsfeld or Condoleezza Rice or, you know, with like we've got some pretty other significant liars in the room that maybe we should be pointing our fingers at as well. No, we're just going to totally, you know, lambast Williams. I mean, he's a prostitute. What do we expect him to do? You know what I mean? That was almost his job. I, I don't I don't know. I'm not surprised by it at all. Oh, no, not at all. But what we're saying is and the point of the piece is. It's going back to the beginning of this conversation about geopolitics, where they're leading us to war again. We're only getting one side, and they keep rolling out the same old flunkies to throw out their crap. Right. Like this guy Emerson, the guy that said, you know, in there's cities in England that you can't go in because they're Muslim. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I wrote in my book Trends in, in um, Trends 2000. I had just been going through it a little while ago, and this little slimer did the same deal when, when, when the Oklahoma City bombing happened. Oh, you're joking. No. No, here, I got it right here, actually. Under, uh, here we go. Um, hours after the, the bomb went off, CBS Evening News featured Stephen Emerson, a ubiquitous terrorism expert who eagerly presented his bias as objective analysis he goes this is quote this was done with the intent to inflict as many casualties as possible he's talking about Oklahoma City right that is a middle eastern trait wow How's that for hatred, you little son of a... Right. Yeah. How's right. that, you little, little low-life, little piece of crap of a man? Wow. You know that, don't you, that killing a lot of people, that's a Middle Eastern trait. And we all know that. And I guess, hey, I guess the Israelis picked up on it, too, because they did a great job in Gaza. That's right. Just down, being down in the Middle East, they only killed 2,100. That doesn't make the, hardly makes the news. And how about the Americans? I guess from bombing people in the Middle East, they pick up those Middle East traits that little low life Emerson was talking about. Mm-hmm. Ah, they only killed about a million over there in Iraq. Hey, how about Afghanistan? Another lovely day. Right. Wait, look at Libya. Our humanitarian mission launched by the, the Peace Prize winner, the Pulitzer Peace Prize winner, or a piece of crap. <laughs> that launched a war, Obama, against a sovereign nation that did nothing to us right. and killed an estimated 30,000 people and has now destabilized the entire region. Mm-hmm. And how many of those destabilized regions are uh, had banking systems that were not affiliated with the Rothschild dynasty before all of this went down? You got it. And, yeah. and, and the Gaddafi was the biggest one. That's right. That's right. Wasn't he trying to go back to a partial gold standard as well? Yes, he was. Okay. Yep. I want to talk a little bit, Gerald, about uh, anything that you might know that's going on kind of behind the scenes right now. I've been hearing these reports coming out from the IMF about something that they're calling a Plan B. Uh, I know that there were a whole bunch of people, as far as I can tell, meeting in Turkey yesterday. Was that the G20 going on in Turkey? Is that significant, the, the meeting of Turkey while these countries are potentially thinking about changing their currency standards and things like that? What do you think is well, going what's on? Well, happen- what's happening is that car- – all these many countries for two reasons. Some countries are going to negative interest rates like Denmark mm-hmm. and they're doing it to protect their currency because the euro is getting battered so badly because Mario Draghi again launched the quantitative easing, which is a scam that only boosts the equity markets. And in anticipation of the Draghi who said he was going to do quantitative easing, now you're looking at the European equity markets at um, seven-year highs. When they did it over in, in um, Japan, they have a different name for quantitative easing. I think the Japanese name is Abenomics. 
and and they got their their equity markets have gone up 57 percent. Oh, wow! When the United States launched quantitative easing in 2009, our equity markets went from essentially 8,000 to about 18,000 now. Now this is at a time when you go back to all of those countries that I mentioned in the regions where well, the standard of living has dramatically declined among we the little people. Uh-huh. While the equity markets have flourished. And you see the numbers. I'm not making them up. The Oxfam report that just came out. Next year, 1% of the people will own 99% of all the dough in the world. That's just insane. I mean, it's just insane. It's like uh, this criminal cabal has reached the pinnacle of criminal cabalness, you know? <laughs> We've never seen anything like this in modern history. Right. This is unprecedented, and the people keep taking it and bending over and bowing down. And and so anyway, going back to the meeting in, 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 in Turkey, in Istanbul, about the interest rate issue, that's on one end, the people and the Swiss trying to protect their currency. The other ones are lowering interest rates in hopes that by having a weak currency, their exporters, and the same thing also with Denmark, of course, Mm-hmm. They have to keep their currency low because their exporters won't be able to sell their stuff if your currency is so high. But that's not going to work if people aren't buying stuff. Right. So it, it, what they're doing is they're grasping for straws. They don't know what they're doing. And that is not in, – in, this is not a speculation. The proof is in the biggest, the biggest central bank in the world – the United States did not know what it was doing when the panic of 08 hit. And you don't have to believe me. All you have to do is read a review of the minutes, salient points of them, and you can see they didn't know it was coming down, didn't believe it was going to happen, and denied it when it did happen. So these aren't bright people. They're shrewd people. Okay. They're slimy people. Right. But they're not bright. You know, a murderer could really be really great at doing, be you know, murder, but that doesn't make them a bright person. I understand. And these people are doing murder in a different way. They're, it's it's murder, rape of our of our lives and livelihoods mm-hmm. for their so they could pump up their buddies. Because one of the trends, you know, just wrote briefly in the current trends journal, the top one is the grand manipulation. And that, of course, was written by Dr. Paul Craig Roberts for us, who's the former assistant treasury secretary under Reagan, and about how this whole thing is being manipulated at all the different levels, the geopolitical level we were talking about and the financial level. And another one trend we're writing about is bankism. And that was written by Nomi Prinz for us, who wrote the book, All the President's Bankers. This is not capitalism. No. It's bankism because in capitalism... There's no such words as too big to fail. And when you put bankism and grand manipulation together, what you have is fascism. And that's what's happened. It's the merger of state and corporate powers. Yes, to to an extent that I don't think we've ever seen before. I mean, the system's got to fail at this point. There's, there's, there's been so much robbery and and uh, you know collusion. It's it's insane. I mean, just look at the mortgage crisis scandal and the MERS institution and uh, the seed company. I mean, uh, just about everybody's mortgage in the country right now is is potentially uh, had the chain of title broken. These derivatives that they've leveraged out of the mortgages here. I mean, these are there's stories that are under the under the radar here that are just so large uh, that I don't think anybody even wants to talk about them because the the p- propensity to just blow this whole thing wide open I think is coming down I'm, I'm guessing here's my question then I guess Gerald is are we going to see more of these kind of surprise announcements from different central banks the you know the surprise unpeggings and things like that are we starting to see infighting going on between the central banks as everybody is kind of jostling for position I don't see any infighting right now. Okay. Because, because they're all in the same game and they all know the deal. When you go back over 2014, for example, and you look at the amount of downgrades on world economic growth for 2015 that came from either the IMF or the, uh, the World Bank, one organization after another on a global scale, you know, said, hey, things aren't good here. So they know how bad it is, and they're mostly in collusion to make this thing work. 
And when I say they, I mean, you know, the, the, the puppets, the puppet states of America. Okay. And, and so they, they're really working tightly to make this thing happen. I'll give you an example. You had, um, when the markets were in trouble, uh, back in the uh, last quarter of 2014, and they started to unravel, when the Federal Reserve finally ended its official quantitative easing, right? Mm -hmm. They ended, the markets are really plummeting. They ended on a Wednesday. All of a sudden on Friday, over in Japan, they come out with round two of Abenomics. Out of nowhere, this is after the first round of Abenomics, just a month prior for the third quarter results, showed a 7.2 percent decrease in their gross domestic product. <laughs> this is after this is after a year of Abenomics, and now they double down on it. Right. But when you look behind what they did, they took the pension funds, the Japanese pension funds, the public funds. And rather than just buying Japanese bonds, what they noted in this massive bailout to the equivalent would be of the United States pumping in three trillion dollars a year Ooh. compared to comparative GDPs mm -hmm. from the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan's, what they announced was they're going to also invest in stock markets, both national and international. And then you saw the stock markets explode again. Right. So when I talk about the collusion, now they're all in it together. Okay. Well, then I have to ask about the other player that's come on the scene recently, and that would be the BRICS organizations. Now, how how are these two? If because I'm with you, I think that there's obviously collusion going on between the Bretton Woods stuff and the uh, and the BRICS bank. But how, do you see them working together? Are we all are they all trying to work towards the same goal here, or how is BRICS going to play into this? I don't think BRICS is going to have the power to make a difference. Really? Okay. Because when you look at the countries, with like Brazil, let's take that one. They're in a recession. Mm -hmm. They're, they're way down because of the other brick, and that's China, one of the other bricks. And here's the equation. It's a very simple one. If the United States and Europe aren't buying things, China's not making them. And if China's not making them, Brazil, Chile, Australia, Canada, Bolivia, all of the Russia, all of the rich natural resource nations are selling less of their product. So people say, you know, these decline in oil prices, you know, that was something that happened because they wanted to punish Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at copper prices. China consumes 40% of all the copper produced each year. Not anymore. They're in a terrible slowdown. Hmm. And so this isn't about oil and, and Putin. It's about commodity prices. You have five and a half year lows across the board, five and a half to six year lows. You could buy a ton of iron ore rebar, reinforcement rod as well in China for cheaper than you could buy a ton of cabbage. Really? Yes. There's too much supply and not enough demand. So when you're looking at the BRICS, you keep going through them. So you have Brazil, Russia, China. We just hit those, right? Mm -hmm. And India. You know, India is always a toss-up. And India is not going to go anywhere if people aren't buying stuff and they're not making stuff. So, and again, of course, you know, the, the other sideline they have is all of these call centers and anything that the United States and could outsource to them for cheaper money, for cheaper help. Right. You know, you know I love getting these calls. You know, oh, hello, this is Rajesh from Citibank. <laughs> 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 yeah, hi there, Rajesh. How you doing? Yeah. You know, so so if they're we're not exporting jobs or or services there, they're not going to do well. They're always a toss up, and they're protecting the rupee as well. And then the other brick is they just threw the yes on there, and that's South Africa. And they're not going to be much of anything, any place, anywhere. Of the many countries I've gone to, that's 
I mean, there are very nice spots around it, but yeah, it's not one of the places I like going back, you know. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's an anything goes at a lot of times, you know. I don't see wealth and prosperity around the corner there. Okay. So, you don't have a lot of strength among the bricks. As much as they want to pull it off, they may be able to be eroding slowly at the United States as a, as a world reserve currency. And indeed, it has declined already from about 80% to some 60%. Mm -hmm. But you look at trade in the yuan, for example, the Chinese currency, it's like that 2.5%, 3% on a global basis. Okay. So it's very low. And so, but at some point, of course, it will change. But right now, it's in a transition period. And people should really tune into China and see what's going on there. You know, there's outflows of capital in, in China. And money's, all the, the smart money's leaving there. I mean, they're buying up the rest of the world. I'll tell you, they're, I mean, they just, they're soaking up Bitcoin like nobody. If you go to uh, fiatleak.com, you can watch Bitcoin purchases in real time. And China, I'll tell you what, they buy more Bitcoin than I, it's, it's staggering sometimes to just sit and watch the flow of Bitcoin going into China right now. Anyway, we've got to take a quick three minute break, Gerald. I hope you can hang on for just a few minutes past this break. I want to encourage everyone to go to trendsjournal.com and uh, subscribe to his newsletter. You guys, a quarterly newsletter. It's fantastic information. You'll get more of what we're experiencing right now with the one and only Gerald Solano. We've got to go to a three-minute break, guys. We'll be right back. Keep it right here. Chris and Sheree Geo here, founders of Truth Frequency Radio. We just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for making TFR the biggest and the best independent radio station out there. When we first entered the alternative media scene in 2009, we were really taken aback by the amount of infighting, backbiting, fear-based reporting, and ego-driven personalities. That's when we knew we had to set ourselves apart and set a new standard in broadcasting. And thus, TFR was conceived as a listener-supported station with no corporate or outside influence and limited commercial interruptions. You can support our efforts by signing up for a VIP membership at truthfrequencyradio.com slash sign up or by making a donation at truthfrequencyradio.com slash donate. For less than $4 a month, you can ensure that TFR continues broadcasting for years to come. Real people, real radio. Wherever you are, make it TFR. Did you know that the blue lotus flower was used by the ancient Egyptians as an aphrodisiac to experience feelings of euphoria and ecstasy? And ecstasy? And ecstasy? Did you know that Thai Kratom was used by the Buddhist monks to produce a relaxing and dreamlike state? Did you know San Pedro Cactus was used by the Native Americans to quest for visions and heal the body? Bouncing Bear Botanicals is your number one supplier of rare and sacred plants and a proud sponsor of Truth Frequency Radio. By clicking on the banner at truthfrequencyradio.com, you can learn more about a vast selection of entheogens, including Amanita muscaria, also known as the sacred mushroom. So click on the banner at truthfrequencyradio.com, and you'll also get up to $40 off your next order. Archaeology, astronomy, alchemy, secrets of the Holy Bible, hidden codes of the Quran, demonology, Tesla technology, solar power, extraterrestrials in the ancient world. More than 500 documentaries, an experimental film lab of cutting-edge music, and art, full-length movies, conference reports, and weekly TV shows. The Enigma Channel is the world's first truly global TV station. www.enigmatv.com Intelligent television for planet Earth. Real people. Real Radio. Wherever you are, make it TFR. Truth Frequency Radio.
Welcome back to the broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you guys for sticking with us through that three-minute break. I do have the bad news that uh, Miss Jamie Hanshaw is under the weather. She won't be able to join us today. But on a better note, uh, Mr. Gerald Salente has volunteered to stick around for just a few extra minutes with us today. And I'll tell you what, spending 40 minutes with Gerald Salente is about as good as it gets, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you right now. So very thankful for him sticking around for just a few minutes. Uh, Mr. Salente, before we went to the break, we had just kind of broached the subject of oil. And I know a lot of people out there are probably uh, just wondering what is going on with oil uh, in terms of what – the uh, the slide might have in in store for us here ramifications of that slide you know here in America and what you think might actually happen in the future going forward since you're uh, so involved with trends forecasting what do we think about oil right now? Well, we you know each night as part of a subscription to the Trends Journal every weekday night uh, we do trends in the news mm-hmm. and I cover oil, gold, and the markets among other things. But every day those three fundamentals so. When oil hit its high of $115 a barrel back in June, you know, I said, well, here it goes. Summer driving season. Boy, they're going to really ratchet it up now. Right. And, of course, there was the Ukraine crisis and the Middle East was heating up again. And oil started going down. I said, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense to me. And then, of course, as Ukraine crisis kept heating up, I said, I wonder if this is payback for, for Putin. Because 45% of Russia's GDP relies on oil and gas exports. And then as time started going by and I started looking into it deeper, our analysis is that this is, again, this is a supply and demand issue. And demand is down around the world. And supply is increased at the same time. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not only in in um, oil, it's in commodity prices from, from, as I said, from nickel to iron ore to copper and on and on. Mm-hmm. So now you go and bring it into your, into the everyday life. Look at the Christmas sales they had before Christmas, 70% off. There's too much product out there. This is unprecedented. This is a new trend that will start only beginning a couple of years now. Hmm. Things used to go on sale after Christmas, not before Christmas. They have too much product out there. And it goes back tying it in again when you have, oh, right here in the States, we have now the gap between the rich and the poor is the widest since, wider than actually during the Gilded Age. Wow. So, so people don't have the money to buy things. Right. And there's too much supply of product, whether it's finished product or commodity product. Now to put it back into its broader context, who else is it hurting? Well, it's hurting more than Putin. Of course, they love to see Venezuela get wrapped, and they're really getting hurt because they need oil at $115 a barrel to balance their budget. But then you look at what's going on in the States. You have some 20%. It's estimated between 15 to 20% of the junk bonds are energy-related yes. from the shale boom. You look what's going on in Canada. They were talking about low interest rates. They're playing the same game. All of a sudden, they said they weren't going to lower their interest rates. They have because they're hoping to export more. So it's a price war. And what you have going on is that the price – will the price of oil go back up? If there's enough cutback of supply, yes. But But – Demand has to also increase at some level, and it's not. Hmm. So this is going to knock a lot of players out of the game, but it's not going to solve the problem. Okay. And the problem is that not enough people have enough money to buy what they need because the wealth is concentrated in the hands of – it's not even the 1%. It's the point zero one percent Right, right. Um. Okay. Well, I want to ask you one final question before I cut you free. I know you've got some other things to go and do, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the shutdown at the U.S. ports that was going on over the weekend, all the shipping, and if that is related to uh, the Baltic Dry Index that seemed to take a pretty significant dip yesterday. Are those two things related, and are, are those things that you're paying attention to and that we should be paying attention to? Well, this has been a union issue for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's really what it's about. And, and unions in this country barely exist anymore. So, uh, in the old days, this would have been standard operating procedure. I think 
is only about 11 percent of the the nation is is unionized anymore, right. and and they're very weak to begin with. So this has been an ongoing um, um, union issue, more than the Baltic Dry Index issue. Okay. Can I ask you one other final question sure, before I sure. let you go? I got a great yeah. one from the chat room. Uh, if you were king of the world, how would you fix all of this? <laughs> oh, I very simple. Yeah. And we're going with, and what we're trying to do, and we are doing on May second, we're launching Occupy Peace. Okay. And it's from Kingston, New York, Colonial Kingston, from the most historic four corners in the United States. The only place where there's a pre-revolutionary war building on each corner. And we're honoring thy founding fathers, who among them, beginning with Washington, no foreign entanglements. Now remember, this is coming out of the mouth of George Washington. Mm -hmm. This is a real commander-in-chief. Not these little boys that drive pickup trucks, play golf, shoot pool, and play basketball. This is the real guy. Right. And he said in his farewell address, no foreign entanglements. Now, the world was at war back then. I, I hate when people say, man, it was a lot different back then. No, it wasn't. And not only Washington, but Franklin and Adams and Jefferson, one after another. No foreign entanglements. So how do we fix it? Bring home the troops. And every country abide by the same principles. Mind your own business. You have your own problems to fix. This has nothing to do with fixing people's problems. It has to do with fixing the mental disorder of psychopaths and sociopaths that get off on tragedies and murder. Yes. And no one wants to call them what they are. Instead, they call them presidents, chancellors, and prime ministers, mm -hmm. bow down, suck up, and roll out a red carpet, and lick their feet and kiss their ring when they arrive. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And the second part of it is self-sustaining economies. And that means putting back up tariffs and putting back in regulations that would dismantled and dismembered to create the multinational one world order which by the way you're also seeing taking form with the trans-pacific partnership and the transatlantic investment partnership yes. they make up these bs words <laughs> so you can't remember them and they have nothing to do with trade they have to do with multinationals having supreme law over sovereign nations just to make it straight and get past the rest of the baloney. So the second part of it is, if I were king, and to quote Mel Brooks, hey, it's <laughs> great to be king. <laughs> the other part would be self-sustaining economies. We don't have to deal with China. We don't have to deal. If I want to buy something, I'll buy prosciutto and parmesan from Italy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll buy great fruit wines from France. I like them better than California wines. <laughs> you know, but we don't we can make our own shirts, our own shoes, our own computers. We need self-sustaining economies. And most of the bigger nations are capable of doing that. And it goes back, by the way, and if anybody wants more information, not only do we have the Trends Journal, we have conferences here as well. And we just had one in, um, in December. And uh, we launched our top trends of 2015. I'm mentioning that because also, as the energy prices are going down, there's growth in now alternative energies. Yes. And as we're seeing them, they're not alternative anymore. They're going to become dominant. From Julius Caesar to Grover Cleveland, the world's leaders went to their inaugurations and coronations in horse and carriage. When the automobile came out, it was alternative transportation. Right. And, it's, and, now, and that's where we're going to see fossil fuels go, the way of the horse and buggy. Candle power to electric. So... Then it goes back to, if I were king, you're going, to have, you're going to have alternative energies that are going to be dominant energies. That means, do you think that 
I, it, what you want to see a disgusting freak show of sociopaths, psychopaths, and lowlifes? All you had to do was watch him go over there from President Obama to Cameron, you name them all over the world, past secretaries of state and current ones going over to kiss the ring of the new king of Saudi Arabia. Yes. Yep. And everybody gets tight when ISIS cuts a couple of heads off. What did they? Did they already the new kings whacked off three? Oh and no, he just we're six. Took, I think we're at six oh, now. <laughs> oh, I lost count. Thank you for yeah, eighty-seven last year, That's right? right? That's right. Yes. And and so anyway, you think that they would be over there if, if Saudi Arabia's major export was broccoli? No, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Well, think of what? Where's Saudi Arabia? Is that some place? I mean, the people wouldn't know where the joint was if they didn't have oil. So it goes back that the future is in our hands. What could be greater than peace? You know, it's so easy to get people to go to war. And have and young men believing in the baloney and, and putting their lives on the line and losing them. Mm-hmm. One of the major stories that should be in the media each day are the 22 veterans that are committing suicide on average each day. The ones who are successful. It's, There's 54 additional ones that are not successful in that same attempt. I mean, I didn't know that. Yeah, we're, terrible. It's a huge number. Huge number. Yeah. And so how easy it is to get them to go to war. And how difficult it is, how difficult it is, and how tiny the stage, if any at all, to speak about peace. That's right. That's right. What a mental sickness that has taken over the world. Hey, all those pharma guys and vaccination freaks, how about a vaccination to stop these people from their psycho? Psych- there's the psychopathic tendencies and sociopathic ailments that are leading the world to disaster. How about a vaccination against war? Well, I'm substantially anti-vaccination, but I would absolutely support one like that. I mean, these people are they're hanging this uh, they're hanging their hat on the ideas of scarcity and competition, and that's what we see: the lies of scarcity and competition being you know prevalent throughout the world. And then they're seeking profit, which is not really a real thing if the money is all fake. And they're actually imposing real death and destruction, you know, around the world uh, in pursuit of this fictitious entity called profit. And that's that's where we're at. That's where we're at. You know. So yeah. So yeah. Again, I I don't believe in the vaccination trip either. You know, in in, in the way that they're doing it. You know, to me, it doesn't make sense. A little child come out of a mother's womb and <laughs> shoot this thing up with a combination of chemicals. <laughs> he can't. You know, nobody knows. You know. Oh, again, when I was a young guy, you know, there was no such thing as autism. And I grew up in Amazon, the first of the baby boomers. We were, we were flooded all over the place. Everybody right. knew everybody. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like you didn't know anybody. This didn't happen like this at this level. And and so is it vaccinations or, you know, it, well, by the way, here's something else that's been in my mind that we're going to be writing more about. This whole push for, toward artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And it really ties into, into vaccinations as well in the sense that, you know, there's, a, there's other ways to do things. Artificial intelligence will be as, as great as sustaining and as original as artificial flavors, artificial coloring, and artificial foods. Well, that it'll, post- it'll bring the same results. If you like artificial flavors, you love all those artificial colors in your food, and you like artificially grown food, you know, with hormones and... Uh, and, and whatever else they shove into it, then you're going to love artificial intelligence. It'll be the way for you. I'm just concerned that they're going to base the intelligence off of the idiots that are running things now. We're going to have well, super again, it'll be it'll be at that level. It'll be at that level. It'll be at a low level. And matter of fact, it's already happening. 
the artificial intelligence. You know, it, 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 I don't know why people call these things smartphones. I call them <laughs> slave phones. Right. It hasn't made anybody smarter that I've seen. If, they, if all this technology was so great, why are we in such problems? If education was working, why do we have the problems that we that exist? Mm -hmm. So no, it's not going to do anything more other than just another line of artificial product. Wow. Well, thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, Gerald, thank you so much for being here. Everybody go check out trendsjournal.com. Let's support Gerald Stalente and all of the things that he does. Gerald, thank you so much. You enjoy the rest of your day, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks again for having me. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's, uh, whew, I'll tell you what, that's a lot of information, and I'll tell you, getting an opportunity to spend, I mean, that was almost 45 minutes with Gerald Salente, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what else we could possibly do for you guys out there, but I'm, uh, I'm pretty much speechless at this point.